Hi everyone, this is Lee here from ABC's of Anesthesia. I'm an anesthetist in Australia. And today we're going to go through CVC or central line insertion. I'm going to go through a whole bunch of things to do with central line insertion, including the aims and indications, the preparation and setup, as well as all the life-threatening things that could happen with this pretty high risk technique and how to prevent them. I'll show you the actual technique and all the troubleshooting steps that I do, as well as what the technique looks like under the skin and what the anatomy looks like as well. We'll also go through some troubleshooting steps as well as ultrasound guidance. Okay, so let's get started. So what is the aim of your central venous line? Well, essentially, if you think about the internal jugular subclavian access routes, it means that your catheter tip is gonna be right near the right atrium. So overall, there's a few reasons I might put a CVC in. For example, I might want to give vasopressors. I might want to give rapid fluid resuscitation. I might want to measure pressures. Or I might just need intravenous access. Now, just to break those things down, a lot of these indications aren't absolutely necessary. For example, in a hurry, I can still give vasopressors through a peripheral line. For example, if I had a patient having anaphylaxis or having a really dire cardiovascular problem, I wouldn't waste time trying to put a CVC in instead of giving vasopressors through a peripheral line. For example, if I had someone with anaphylaxis, I'd still give adrenaline via a peripheral line and just make sure it gets flushed through. And that would have very low risk of tissue necrosis or anything like that. You don't have to waste time putting a CVC in. And you know, most people would be, feel pretty comfortable running metaraminol, other vasopressors peripherally for a period of time. Now, if you're thinking that you're gonna need long-term access, that's when you might want a CVC, you know, long-term access and long-term infusion of vasopressors. Now, you might want to give large volumes of fluid very quickly to a patient, especially if they're having a massive hemorrhage. But just know that the fastest way to get fluid in is, again, a peripheral line, like a large gauge, 14 gauge, or a RIC catheter. And these are amazing ways of giving large volumes of fluid really quickly. Now, that said, if I had real difficulty with IV access, I know that I can get central access in. And I'd always put a central line in because I can still give large volumes. They just won't be as fast as with a peripheral line. Now, if I did really want large volume resuscitation through a central vein, I'd use a max sheath. And that's a talk for another time. Now, you might say you want to put the central line to measure the CVP. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of good reasons why you want to, why you might want to measure the CVP. For example, knowing the pressures in the right heart might enable you to calculate a whole bunch of other things. But just know that there's many other ways of, say, understanding fluid responsiveness using pulse pressure variation with an arterial line. It's a fantastic way of knowing whether your patient is going to be fluid responsive. One of the really good indications for a central venous line pressure monitoring would be when you're doing a liver resection. Now, really good studies have shown that low, the lower the CVP, the less blood loss during a liver resection. So that's one of the really big indications I would have uh, to put a central venous line to measure that CVP during hepatic resection. Okay, so one of the main reasons I would put a CVC in is someone who has just really difficult IV access. So I've had a few times where intravenous drug user or a patient who's had chemotherapy with just amazingly tiny veins or just an absence of all peripheral veins. In that case, I really need to put a central line because I need really secure access for this case. So I really want you to think about the reason why you might put a CVC in. So it's not always easy to imagine what's exactly going on when we're putting a CVC in. And so I thought I'd use this model here to try and demonstrate. So now imagine that this is the neck up here, and that's going down towards the arm. Here we have the lung. So what we have here is the internal carotid artery, and that's the subclavian artery in red. So here we have the internal jugular vein, the subclavian vein, and they join together to form the superior vena cava, which then enters the right atrium. Now what I want is I want my CVC to enter and remain just above the right atrium. So when you perform a chest x-ray, this catheter tip should roughly be at the sternal angle level. So for my preparation, first of all, make sure I mention the procedure and I talk about the risks, benefits, and alternatives. Um, so I've consented the patient. It'd be pretty good to have IV access, but that's not always the case when I'm putting a CVC in. And I have my usual monitoring, assistance, other medications I meet, and equipment. Now, in terms of my preparation, I'm doing surgical aseptic non-touch technique, which means a full surgical scrub. I've got the surgical gown on, surgical sterile gloves on, as well as mask and hat. Now, there's really good studies that show 
that if the patient is completely draped, so essentially I've got a full drape across the patient, as well as someone making sure that I'm doing everything correctly with a checklist, that improves patient outcomes and decreases infection. So it's a really good thing probably to adopt if you've got the luxury of that. So now let's talk about the central line kit. Now, this is an arrow multi-lumen central venous catheterization set. As you can see, there's quite a few things in there and it's quite involved. So it's really important to know your equipment. So it also tells me some really useful information about the priming volumes of each lumen. For example, the distal lumen, about 0.44 mils, the medial lumen, about 0.39 mils, and then the proximal, again, 0.39 mils. So imagine that I'm running noradrenaline on adrenaline and I've started the flow at around, you know, five mics per minute. I can then calculate exactly how long before it reached the end of the lumen. And that's a really important thing to know roughly so you can turn down your noradrenaline and adrenaline as required. Today we'll be demonstrating internal jugular vein cannulation. So it's important that we've got around a 20 centimeter length. So it's not a larger one such as you might have for ephemeral vein cannulation. So when I first opened my CVC kit, this is pretty much what I see. Obviously, I'd have a full surgical scrub on, I'd have a sterile, sterile gloves on, but just for purposes of demonstration, I'll just use my hands. So as I open the kit, uh, this is what I'd see. And the first thing I do is line up everything in the order with which I'd use it. For example, first of all, I have some a 5 mil syringe and a 23 gauge hypodermic needle with some 1% lignocaine. And that would be the first thing that I use. Next, I would use this needle and this syringe. And I take the cap off and put in line. That will be my next puncture. After that, I've got my wire. And the first thing I do here is I set it up. So I take this off and see that it's got a curvature. That curvature is to stop this tip here traumatizing any part of your central vein, your internal jugular vein, or your superior vena cava. So what I do is I just prep that so that I'm able to easily feed it through my syringe and needle. I then get it ready so it's really easily able to be fed through the syringe and needle. And as it comes through the other side of the needle there, it now flips over into a bit of a horseshoe, and that means that it's really safe against any wall, that it's not going to traumatize the wall when it's down near the superior vena cava or the right atrium. So that's ready. After the wire goes in, my needle comes out, and then I use a scalpel to make an incision to widen the skin incision. I then dilate with this device here that goes over the wire and dilates the skin and a bit of the vein. The final thing I do is I will load this through now. So there's some parts of this kit that aren't adequate. So first of all, my assistant or nurse will provide me with some saline in one of these chambers. I will also need IV bungs in some kits. So I get those given to me in a sterile fashion. I need plenty of gauze for this, as well as tegaderm dressing afterwards. I need one of these antibiotic coated discs and also a suture kit. So as you can see, having really having as you can see, having enough trolley space is really vital. Finally, four O monofilament suture is probably adequate. Also, I find that an extra 10 mil syringe is really useful. So now that I've got everything lined up and ready, the next thing I do is I prep my CVC line. I take some saline. I then cap all but the distal lumen. Now, I don't cap the distal lumen because that's where the wire is going to feed. I then flush each of these lumen with saline making sure that the clamps are unclamped and I make sure that they're patent. So you'll see, there we go, then some saline out from that lumen. You'll see it from that lumen. And then finally, you'll see it from the distal lumen. I also want to make, make it really clear that I want to be really protected in this space. It's very easy to get a sharps injury when you're dealing in an emergency situation with so many sharp objects. So generally speaking, even though I've lined up, it, lined it up like this, once I've used one of the sharp devices, I then put it into this blue tray. So I know that's my sharp area. So 
So now I'm going to demonstrate the CVC insertion under ultrasound guidance. That's probably the most common way we do it these days, especially with such ready access to point of care ultrasound. Now that said, I think it's really important to know both the landmark techniques or so the blind approach without an ultrasound and the ultrasound just in case you know, the ultrasound isn't available, it malfunctions, and that can happen. So just having the ability to do both techniques, I think, is really, really important. So before I get started, I make sure that I've got all the prep just ready. That means I've scrubbed, surgical gown, surgical gloves, sterile gloves, mask, and hat. But for this demonstration, I'm just going to be bare uh, just to make sure I can demonstrate effectively. I make sure I've got everything lined up. So I've got the patient here. The angle of insertion is going to be in this direction. So I'm ergonomically you know, right. I've got my ultrasound there. And I've got all of my kit and sterile tray over here. The ultrasound should also have sterile gel and a sterile cover. When I first put the ultrasound on, I first check the orientation to make sure that I'm looking at the right way. And I just use my finger against the gel there. And what we can see here, we can see two structures. This one here is the artery and that one is the vein. And you can see it's been punctured a few times and that's why it looks a little bit distorted. Usually it's a beautiful elliptical shape. One thing to point out, you do not want this artery to be directly underneath the vein. So you make sure that you orientate your probe such that that isn't the case. For example, if I rotated my probe to this side like that, on the angle like that, my artery is now below the vein. So I make sure that I rotate and transfer my probe such that the vein is in the right position. Good. So that's just to show you the landmarks. This was an awake patient. I put local anesthetic into the region where I think I would need to go. And usually what I'd do is I'd feel for the carotid pulse, knowing that the vein is adjacent to it and just lightly, uh, just in the subcutaneous tissue, infill local anesthetic, put that in the sharps area. So next thing I do, I find the right location. So say a couple of centimeters above the clavicle. And then I put my needle and I try to see where my needle is. So right there is my needle on the screen. And that's going right above the carotid. So I'm going to actually just move it across so it's near where the vein is. And now as I, I'll go at about a 45 degree angle, always trying to keep an idea of where my vein is. And so I'm jiggling there. You can see the tissue distortion. I'm aspirating as I go in, tilting the angles as I need to. And then trying to get, there we go. So notice that I wasn't going smoothly. I was really trying to do sharp, short stabs. And as you can see there, I've now got uh, blood flow back. I just make sure that I confirm that I'm in. And sometimes I have to pull back a little bit. Take my wire. Sure, goes about even 30 seconds. Again, I'm keeping an eye on exactly what's happening with the monitor. I then take the needle out, and again, I'm just pushing with my wire to make sure that everything is fine like that. And then that goes into the sharps area. I want to make sure that I'm in the right position. So look at that. You can see that white dot there. That is the wire. And it's going into the IVC very far away from where the artery is, the carotid artery is nowhere near that wire. So that's really important. So I know I'm in the, I'm pretty confident I'm in the right spot. I make sure that my wire can move adequately. Next part, I make an incision. And so again, I just go alongside the wire, make sure I'm not cutting down onto the wire and just do a quick stab like that and make sure the wire is free within that extra five to 10 millimeter incision. At this point, you often get a lot of blood flow occurring, a lot of bleeding, so I just dab that. I now load the dilator just onto the wire. And this can be the tricky part. Again, I make sure that I've always got eyes on the wire. It never goes in past the dilator. And then I just do a short dilation. Just remember, I'm not dilating all the way down to the hub because that can cause a laceration and tear this SVC. So I'm only going in about maybe three centimeters or so. I'm now ready to put the wire. And again, in my sterile field, I just load the tip of this wire across like that. And again, I've got my eyes on the wire at all times. 
I make sure that it comes out from this distal end before I do anything. So I can see that that's all safe. This is a 20 centimeter catheter, that's 10 centimeters, and that's 15 centimeters. So that point, I insert down to about 11 or so centimeters. I take the wire out, and you should be able to see a very slow blood flow back. Again, I put my finger on the end here to make sure that I'm not in the wrong spot. You can sometimes see the catheter, there you can see it there, but it's not as bright as the wire. What I do then is I check that I'm in the right position by aspirating, and you can see the red blood back. And at that point, I can now cap the distal lumen with this bone. Just like what I did for the distal lumen, I check and aspirate, and you can see the red blood come back, and that's all good. And I just check that all lumens are working before I can use this. So make sure it's around 11 centimeters, which is there, and then I'm able to tie it down. It's really important, first of all, that when I dress this, I clean away all of that gel, because that really impairs the adhesiveness of your dressing. I use this antibiotic coated disc, and that's the blue side facing up, and that's really important to just keep the side clean. I'm able to stitch this down. Now, in our hospital, we always say you need four points of uh, suturing. In my hospital, in the hospitals I worked at, we always put four points of suturing. So that means I've got these two and these two. And I suture that in place, which I won't do on this mannequin. And finally dress it with an upside dressing. But do dress however your institution recommends the dressing occur. Now, before the central line is ready to use, make sure you check with a chest x-ray. Make sure the tip of your catheter in the right side of IJ CVC is around the level of the sternal angle. Now, how does this go horribly wrong? Now, every time I do an invasive procedure, or any procedure really, I try to think about the ways that this might fail completely. And then I really mindfully think about those things and try to mitigate those problems. Now, what's new with ABCs of Anesthesia is that we're forming a whole bunch of very comprehensive courses for every stage of your anesthetic journey, from medical student to procedural skills, from foundations in anesthesia, as well as really important exam lectures and clinical anesthesia courses as well.